Okay, welcome to video two for Nidaria. Um, we left off talking about the uh, body plan of Nidarians. Uh, the basic body structure is rel is pretty much the same for both the polyp here, there's stuck to the bottom form and the medusa form. The main difference being that, of course, that this one is free swimming and this one is uh, stuck to the bottom. Um, but what that we um, what we call this two-layered beastie here, where it's got the outer layer and an inner layer, and those are the only two tissue layers, and this is not separated by this non-living material uh, in between, is called diploblastic. Okay, so blast is another word for a layer, and die for two, so two-layered. Okay, and this is um, one layer on the outside, one layer on the inside, and that is called diploblastic. Okay. All right. Again, this uh, just going through um, a closer look at the polyp. It consists of a cylinder with an oral cone, okay, and tentacles around the mouth, and um, it is attached to the substrate. If you go down and try to uh, dig a uh, anemone off of the rocks, try to go down, down to Leisure Island and go to the uh, Mount Main Beach side. Pull, try to pull one of the uh, large uh, camouflage anemones off of the rocks and you'll find that it's very difficult to do it. But if you get your fingers in at the very edge here and just sort of uh, move them back and forth and work them in, you can actually work this um, uh, this uh, whole anemone, the whole polyp, right off of the rock, and you'll see that it'll actually start to stick to your hand. This is sort of a sucker disc sort of area here, this petal disc, and it's got a slightly thickened structure compared to other parts of the uh, of the anemone. Okay, and that is called a petal disc, or it can have little projections coming off called stolons. So if you remember what stolons were from periphera then there were also little projections that came off that were reproductive or could start another colony growing off of, the, uh, off of that area. So in an asexual way, reproductive. Okay, the dome or the bell of the medusa is here and then it's got the tentacles again surrounding the mouth. The other one was facing up, this is facing down. Okay, the ventral surface is on the bottom the manubrium, the mouth, we've been through that before. Okay. Now, these um, cnidarians exhibit something called symmetry, which m almost, well, pretty much all of the body forms that we're going to look at uh, for the rest of the uh, animal phyla. And most, animal in the, most animals in the, well, the whole of the animal kingdom will have some sort of symmetry and these ones have what we call radial symmetry. So the interesting thing about these things is you could cut them into half as long as you go through the very center and go in half in any direction just like a pie you're gonna have both sides exactly the same. So if you think about like an apple pie or uh, a, a cake that's round or something like that, if you cut it in half it's going to be exactly the same on both sides. Okay, so you can cut slices out of the pie. So it's just like the spokes of a wheel radiating out from the center. Okay, so and they they can be cut along the radius. All right, and so any sections that are uh, about the same thickness, uh, with a little exception, obviously, if you cut right down the middle of the tentacle, that's going to make a difference. But they are called they're going to be symmetrical on both sides, and that's called radial symmetry. All right. Uh, this is, in case you need a lot of um, definitions, you can go through these a little more slowly, um, and these are de definitions for what we've already been going through. So we'll leave this. Uh, you can you can freeze the uh, video on this frame and have a look at it if you or copy these down if you'd like for flashcards or the like. 
Okay, here is uh, feeding. These are, again, still the general tech characteristics of all cnidarians. They're all carnivorous, so they all hunt, and they have tentacles, which they're used to obtain zooplankton or as things as big as fish, so other suspended particles, generally small stuff, but often can be quite big stuff as well. And I encourage you to go down and um, uh, break up a cat's eye or or something on the on the shore and go ahead and feed it to a um, an anemone. Okay, you get you learn a lot by uh, by um, by uh, well interacting with the with the marine environment. And if you're a bit squ well, if you if you um, are a bit more sensitive and would not like to kill one of the uh, animals down there then you can take some freshly killed cow or chicken or pig or some sort of meat that you bought from the store and um, take a little bit of that and and feed it to these um, anemones and you'll find that the same kind of uh, you'll get the same kind of reaction all right the stinging cells called cnidocytes okay they contain barbed harpoons so they're a bit like a um, uh, a um, what do you call it? A spear gun. And the spears are called nematocysts. And these things line the tentacles, the nidocytes, the the, um, the cells, line the tentacles and pierce the skin of the prey and then uh, inject a poisonous cord into it. A cord that's full of poison and that immobilizes or uh, and the, uh, that immobilizes, paralyzes the uh, the prey. Okay, so here we go. Let's have a look at how this works. All right. If you imagine trying to capture you know, some sort of live prey without the aid of teeth or a jaw or hard protective body parts, and your body is gelatinous tissue and is delicate, could be easily destroyed by struggling prey, you can't really come up with a much better system than something like this. It, it, what happens is we've got this cnidocyte, and if you remember site, means what? That's right, cell. Okay, here's this cnidocyte. These are the cells, this lining here, and that whole thing is is one cell. It's lined up. This is the, the uh, front of the tentacle. This is the, the outside of the tentacle. It's lined, all of these cnidocytes are lined up on the side of the tentacle, and inside the cell is this little cyst, which is like a pocket. Okay, and that cyst is called the nematocyst, and inside it has a stinging cell with this little trap door, which under the right circumstances can pop open, and since there's hydrostatic pressure in here, it'll shoot this little cord out, this little um, this harpoon out, pierce the skin, this is the skin or integument of the prey, and once it does that, then this little cord is injected and that cord is just full of poison. Okay, so they're mostly for prey capture but also secondarily as a defense mechanism. So they not only inject the the toxins but they also hold the prey in place with the means of these little barbs on the nematocyst that's on this um, harpoon that's fired out. And the good thing about this for the for the um, cnidarian tentacle is that it also keeps the um, prey at a little bit of a distance. So this struggling prey won't um, the struggling prey won't hopefully won't uh, break the the um, that outer tissue layer of the tentacle. Okay. So let's have a look at one of these. Okay, here you have your nidocyte. Your nidocyte, that's the cell okay, that holds the nematocyst. And here is the stinging barb, the um, harpoon, if you will, that's shot out. And you can see the cord coming out here. Now look at all of these little um, backwards facing little barbs. Now if you imagine how hard it would be once this is in to pull out of the skin. Uh, you can see how a prey, prey would be very uh, hard pressed to get that out of its uh, skin once it's been fired in. Okay, same with us. If we get um, stung by a jellyfish, then we have these things sticking into us. 
Okay, and we'll have another look at another micrograph. Okay, so some of these, this one is a nidocyte with the nematocyst all coiled up on the inside. Remember, a nematocyst is not the cell, the nidocyte is the cell. Here's the nidocyte cell. Here it's been fired, and you can see all the little barbs on it. And um, obviously, this uh, can, you can see is at quite a distance from the edge of the the cell, and you can and then again that's to hold that prey struggling at a slight distance away from the from the skin of the of the tentacle. Okay. So what makes nidocytes fire their nematocysts? So if you can imagine that if uh, it was only touch, then the nidocytes, of course, would be firing their nematocysts every time another tentacle uh, swung up or was moved around by the water current or if there was any kind of motion, especially in uh, tide pools where there's a lot of wave action, where the tentacles get washed around. Every time they touched each other, they'd just be stinging each other. So obviously there are some chemical cues where they can recognize themselves, but also physical cues. So there's pH, um, other chemicals that would be given off. Uh, pretty much everything that's alive leaks chemicals out, and that's what we call kind of, uh, that's what we would call um, like a smell. Okay, so if you you would have a smell, a dog would be able to come up and recognize you even if it was uh, blindfolded, uh, if it's your dog. And um, that is because of all the uh, chemicals that you're just leaking out all the time. All right, now animals do that as well, and I'm sure that uh, these ni cnidarians can recognize their prey and other things that they don't want to sting. Now, um, what c sort of damage can these things do? If you look at this, this is a box jellyfish sting. Uh, you might have heard of things called um, irukandji. Uh, this is up in uh, uh, in Queensland, in northern Australia. Some certain places you can't go swimming without um, wearing dive skins, or um, and they have netting around beaches to keep these things out. But um, they could be quite deadly. Actually, here's a a leg that's been stung all over the place. And um, here's uh, somebody's face where they only got a couple of little tiny stings. They had every, um, this was a diver, just a couple of little stings around, uh, where one tentacle got around next to the, uh, next to the um, regulator. So several people die each year from uh, Irukandji in, um, in northern Australia. And reports are that apparently they're getting uh, stronger. Or the uh, the stings are getting worse. Okay, the poison is getting worse. So for some reason, they might be getting um, more venomous. All right, for reproduction of uh, cnidarians. Again, still the general characteristic of characteristics of cnidarian. Okay, so for asexual reproduction, they may bud off, in which case, an, another young one just grows right out of the side. Um, or they may grow out a medusa stage. Okay, so you could have a, a one of these things grow off and then just attach by the pedal disc or the stolon to the adjacent uh, substrate. Or this thing may swim off depending on the species. Okay. And here is a gastrozo feeding polyp from a hydroid colony, and you can see loads of little new um, uh, polyps right here, 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 just budding off from the side of the uh, uh, the polyp. Okay, and then sexually they reproduce as well, uh, where they will broadcast eggs and sperm into the water uh, column, and if they find each other, the eggs and sperm can fertilize each other and be and create something called a planula larva, which is exactly the same kind of larva that we saw in uh, peripherans. And when you see things like this, it gives you a clue that one uh, group has probably evolved from another group. And we'll have a look a little closer at that in class. 
but planula so they're microscopic covered in, in tiny cilia so you can see the tiny little cilia which they beat to move the larva around and they settle on a suitable surface or else uh, just transform into a medusa and um, then grow into the adult form. Okay. For Cnidaria, you're responsible for three classes for taxonomy. We're, we're going to go as far as, uh, well, we'll go a little bit further than this, but you've, the, you can remember Cnidaria has HAS, three common classes, and the H stands for Hydrozoa, the A for Anthozoa, and the S for Scyphozoa. Hydrozoans are the hydroids and, man, and the Portuguese man of war, blue bottles, that kind of thing. Anthozoa were pretty much looking at all of the stuff that's stuck to the ground, like um, soft corals, sea anemones, hard corals, uh, all of the the uh, larger stuff that you'll see that's um, uh, that is attached, and usually. Uh, well, I wouldn't say, okay, often uh, colonial, often uh, solitary. And then Scyphozoa, which are your true jellyfish. Okay, and then there's a fourth class called uh, Cubozoa, or box jellyfish. And it tends to have um, a bell and then four areas for attachment. Now, this one looks like it's got legs all over the place and uh, tentacles all over the place. But if you had a close look at it, you'd see that there are four actual bundles of uh, tentacles and these are the ones that um, luckily are not common in New Zealand waters because these are the ones that do that um, cause all the damage here we go this is the uh, this is uh, one of the this is one of the main uh, stingers in Australia that that um, kills people quite regularly okay and Okay, there are, I have some websites listed, but we'll go through those in, in class. All right, uh, we will go through the hydrozoans, and then that will be enough for this video. Right, hydrozoans, so they're often mistaken for plants owing to their bushy appearance. Right? Usually when we're going to see, what you, we're going to focus on what you're going to see when you're diving now. Okay, and this is the kind of stuff we see. Uh, lots and lots of species. We generally just call this stuff hydrozoan fuzz or hydrozoan trees, and but you'll see quite a bit of this. These are colonial. Now there might be a thousand or more individuals um, in this little colony, maybe up to five thousand uh, individuals in this little colony of um, of hydrozoans, and. All of these things are clones of each other. They're butted off from a single individual. Here's another um, hydrozoan little uh, hydrozoan colony, and we see an amphipod um, sitting on it. So very good camouflage here. This is a amphipod that would live preferentially on this type of hydrozoan. Okay, here's a hydrozoan tree. And here's some of the other hydrozoan trees. We'll see lots of these. I think this was was taken out at Alderman's. Um, beautiful clear water in the background, but you see all these little hydrozoan trees. Uh, a lot of nudibranch food there. These. Okay. There's another um, bit of hydroid fuzz. You can see that this is on a carpophyllum uh, stalks, and this is one that you'll see quite commonly out in um, oh, well, pretty much all, all over the place but shallow reefs uh, t tends to you tend to find this yellow stuff in uh, areas that are, don't have quite as nice visibility uh, Karawa Island inshore uh, the marine reserve at um, um, at Hahe when we go to Fidianga that kind of place okay here is a stick hydrozoan tubularia so these are uh, um, multiple polyps actually here and we probably won't have a closer look at these but you'll see these when diving and they can be really beautiful they're probably only about uh, eight or ten centimeters long with these with these stalks but they look like a nice flower on the end of a stalk okay so they often uh, form colonies okay of uh, asexually derived polyps which means they're cloned off of each other here's uh, a nice colony of 
of hydroids on a hermit crab and you can see that that probably gives a lot of nice protection to hermit crabs to the hermit crab as well as um, a good place for this thing to move because the hermit crab will be eating stuff be, might be a messy eater lose a bit that these things can pick up and also these things will get transported along and here's another type of hydrozoan colony okay hydrozoans tend to be pretty much the in the adult form they're they're sessile they're polyps and um, so this is an interesting case where this is a blue bottle or a man of war and it's got this little float which is actually another type of polyp um, it's called a pneumatophore and we'll have a look at those in a minute okay typically benthic they're colonial organisms consisting of polyps of different forms All right. they're probably they're the simplest of, of um, structures of polyps and typically attached and typically colonial so they usually and really for everything that you're going to be concerned with and seeing you're going to be looking at um, polyps that are attached and colonies okay that's with the hydrozoans All right. so very simple there's a bag within the bag okay they may be butting off a few tentacles and then your um, uh, the mouth okay. and then there's a special case the uh, Portuguese man of war here again we see the float now this polyp here you might not think that this is colonial but this is a colony of, of um, of clones that just take different for forms okay so this is a polyp that has this specialized structure and it acts as a sail alright but it also acts as a point of attachment this one is called the pneumatophore okay and then it's got different polyps all clones of each other with the same genetic material just like your finger and your eye have the c cells in those areas have the same genetic material but they express it differently so this one takes the form of a gastrozoid okay a zoid is a polyp a zoid is an animal really but a zoid in this case is one single individual and gastro just like we saw before means stomach so these ones are digesting polyps these ones do all the digestion and they're specialized to be very good at it okay and then you have the dactylozoid which is the hunting tentacle okay the batteries and nematocysts along here okay for hunting and defense they'll tend to be long these are the ones that are string that are hanging way way down okay these are the ones that are hopefully going to run into um, run into uh, the prey capture it transfer it to the um, gastrozoid in order to be digested and then finally the gonozoids okay so these ones gono like gonads uh, is reproductive so these re polyps are reproductive and that's all they do they just pump out babies so these ones are very good at hunting they transfer it to these which are very good at digesting which share the food around to all the other polyps including the nematophore and the um, these these ones then just pump out lots of babies okay up to two millimeters or two meters in size for the um, hard, for the Portuguese man of war but most are quite small um, they have a chitinous envelope this is the uh, here's the definition for chitin okay and you can stop and write that down if you like tough protective semi-transparent substance a little bit like uh, uh, like our fingernails or something and they use that that's the um, that's the outside of the colony okay so if we look at the colony there we go so all of this is a chitinous envelope you could think of it as the the um, concrete and steel of an apartment block and then the apartments are the little areas with the inside the interior the the spaces that the zoids can live within so when we're talking about a colonial hydrozoan um, we're talking about an apartment block with lots of little individuals that are all clones of each other growing out of it so you can see here the gonozoids of the eggs uh, 
and then you see the gastrozoids, which are out hunting. And that's arborescent means tree-like. Okay, so this is a tree-like uh, form. Okay, life cycle. Okay, the asexually they reproduce by budding, and sexually they reproduce um, with eggs and sperm, and then they may have uh, a planula larva, which settles onto the substrate, or they may have um, a second stage where a medusa will uh, will swim away. Okay, they'll produce a medusa, which is male or female, which will go up, and then that will re reproduce. That will produce lots of eggs. This thing can still hunt, eat. Okay, it's a small little stinger, and that thing might produce lots of eggs or sperm. And these, um, and this might be a way of getting the um, uh, the eggs and sperm to be more widely distributed or even for these things to find each other and then release a lot of eggs and sperm that can fertilize each other more readily up in the water column. And then that can um, turn into a planula larva and uh, grow into a full another adult colony. And that is the end of hydrozoans. That's everything you need to know about hydrozoans. So we'll end this and continue on in Cnidarian 3.